Thank you so much, JJ, for that really nice introduction, and it's so nice to see so many people here. I also wanted to thank Dr. Hirschfeld in our department and my humanities colleagues for the invitation to give this year's Faith and Reason lecture. I especially want to thank all of you students for coming here tonight, and especially my students in my ACS classes. Can you raise your hand and wave? It's so nice to see you. Good job in being here. Good job. Um, and also my architecture and religion in America class, uh, my students in that class, thank you so much for coming. This lecture is for you guys. I have a very direct argument to make tonight. Religion in the university has declined substantially since the late 19th century, and that decline is visible in the architecture of the chapel and the library, the symbols of faith and reason on campus. I will also argue to you that the distancing of faith from the project of higher education damages what I, like many of the professors in the Department of Humanities, see to be the aim of the university, the formation of the whole student. Of course, I am talking here to you tonight who either chose or maybe your families chose for you to attend a denominationally Catholic university. From the moment you stepped onto Villanova's campus, you were surrounded by a built environment that conveyed to you that religion is important here. Many of you walk from the main lot or south every morning and go by St. Thomas of Villanova Church. You walk past the new grotto on your daily treks through campus. You get coffee at the cheekily named Holy Grounds. Right now, at this very moment, you are hearing this lecture in a building surmounted by a cross. Many of you have classes in Mendel, a science building, and even here you walk under the sign of the cross in your entry to the building. You attend classes and classrooms which have a cross or a crucifix displayed, just like these Villanovans, these male Villanovans, did in a chemistry class in Mendel in 1930, and there's a crucifix on the wall right there. You are required in your ACS classes to read the Old and New Testaments and St. Augustine's Confessions. You are required to take theology. Implicit and explicit in your education here at Villanova is the idea that faith, morality, and religion matter. But what I want to stress to you tonight is that the kind of education that you receive here at Villanova is not the same kind of education received by most university students in the United States. Religion is now very much not a part of American higher education. To explore this, I want to divide this lecture into two parts. First, I ask that you indulge me a bit as I explain my own college experience and what it has to do with faith and reason. Second, I will explore in greater depth two examples of the chapel and the library at Harvard and Yale to show how the relationship between religion and the university changed greatly in the 20th century. I will conclude by arguing that higher education needs religion, or at least a humanistic form of it, and that a college education is not just about the job you get after graduation, but rather the person you become. Now for part one. For my undergraduate studies, I made the rather dubious choice of attending the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Don't get me wrong, the University of Minnesota is a fantastic public institution, but it wasn't the right choice for me. And as you might imagine, the weather in Minneapolis is terrible in the winter, right? It was not a good choice for me. At the time, I was very interested in the basic sciences, and I started out as a biochemistry major, and I ended up graduating as a biology major. Of course, now I'm an architectural historian, so I made a big change in my academic life. When I arrived on campus, I found a campus with some great architecture and some bad architecture for the bad. This was my science building where I had my biochemistry and microbiology classes and where I worked as an undergraduate researcher dealing specifically with cancer. This kind of architecture from the 1970s is known as brutalism, <laughs> named for the use of raw concrete and its heavy mammoth structures. In better architecture, the University of Minnesota has one of famed architect Frank Gehry's early buildings. This is the Wiseman Museum from the 1990s. It is a hallmark Gehry building in what we call deconstructivist architecture with its metallic sheathing and sculptural forms. The campus also has some quintessential collegiate architecture, like this mall designed by architect Cass Gilbert around 1910 in the style of the American Renaissance filled with buildings in the style of what we call the Beaux-Arts. What I didn't find on campus, and here I show you the main quad envisioned by Cass Gilbert, 
was any expression of religion. No crosses on the buildings, no chapels, nothing. Since the University of Minnesota is a publicly funded state institution, this is perhaps to be expected. Where religion was located was in the Catholic Newman Center, the Jewish Hillel, and other denominational chapels on campus that ring the campus periphery. What is a, and this is a common pattern for public universities. But what you might say was a religiously neutral space on the Minnesota campus itself was transformed into something negative in the classroom, where, where religion was in many ways denigrated. I remember an instance in one of my classes in which the professor derisively stated that Catholics are cannibals because they eat the body of Christ in the Eucharist. The professor simply made the assertion. He did not consider the theological implications of transubstantiation or the notion that the Eucharist is the living body of Christ and does not carry with it the negative connotations we give to cannibals who eat dead human flesh. I am Catholic and I remember being so angry at my professor but, but also not having the courage at the time to challenge him in class. For those uh, humanities majors here and for my colleagues, you might be very interested to know and be able to appreciate the irony that this occurred in my humanities class. Yeah, it was actually in my humanities class. Religion too was both implicitly and explicitly excluded from my science classes and my science labs. I worked with several scientists in their labs who were expressed atheists. For them, practicing science was a natural extension of their worldview. I grew to understand that faith and reason were separate in academic life. I grew to assume that higher education had nothing to do with religion, which is very much the opposite of the message you receive here at Villanova. So here is where my thinking uh, am, uh, changed, and my, uh, my understanding of this concept between faith and reason changed. In my sophomore year, I made a trip to Yale University to visit my boyfriend at the time, the man who is now my husband. When I stepped onto Yale's campus, I was simply transported. I found a place that was completely different than my university. In contrast to the 500 students I had in my American history class, my now husband was in a history seminar of 10 students. The campus was to my eye just beautiful in its neo-Gothic and neo-colonial architecture. When my husband took me on a tour of the campus, we walked past Harkness Tower, which you see in this image on the right. We walked by Yale's Payne Whitney Gymnasium, whose exterior form recalled a cathedral. We walked up Prospect Avenue to the Yale Divinity School, where our own Dr. Cohen Hoven attended grad school, uh, which is a colonial revival complex that recalls Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia. What Yale taught me was something of the in-between of Villanova's campus focused on faith and the University of Minnesota's campus composed in terms of reason. I could see vestiges of, of religion in certain parts, reflective of Yale's congregational Protestant past. But I also knew from my husband's experience that religion was not part of his everyday experience at Yale. Present day Yale was something very different than historical Yale and the kind of educated education it imparted. And I could see that its architecture was a record of this change. Uh, this visit uh, to Yale was a big reason why I switched from biology to architectural history, and it began my study of religious architecture on the American University campus. Now for part two of my talk. To understand the shift of religion's relationship to the university, you have to understand just how fully religion was once intertwined in higher education. Until the late 19th century, religion was an endemic part of the university campus and educational mission. And here I show you some of Yale's original buildings called Old Brick Row, uh, which included not one but two chapels, as you can see. Many American colleges were founded by religious denominations. Yale was originally Congregational, Harvard, Puritan, Brown Baptist, the College of William and Mary Anglican, Princeton closely aligned with the Presbyterian Church. Mandatory services, uh, both daily and on Sundays, were a long-standing tradition at many colleges, even public colleges, and would not end widely until the 1960s. As college and university enrollment expanded, so did the college chapel. Worship services were initially held in a room in the college main, but by the 19th century, uh, institutions constructed increasingly larger standalone worship spaces in the lavish style of the Victorian period. At Yale, these Wren Gibbs style first and second chapels on College Row gave way to the beautiful Marquand, uh, excuse me, the beautiful Battelle Chapel. At Princeton was the eclectic Romanesque Marquand Chapel. At Cornell University, the incredibly detailed Sage Chapel. 
However, by the 19th, late 19th and early 20th centuries, the centrality of religion on the campus came under question. By this time, American universities had distanced themselves from their founding religious denominations. Presidents and faculty were no longer necessarily clergy. The mission of the university moved away from the training of ministers, and theology had been displaced from the curriculum. Most importantly, the German ideal of research became the new cornerstone of the modern university. A student revolution against mandatory chapel policies was also underway, as this cartoon parody of the need to collect so-called chapel checks, proving attendance at chapel uh, at services at Princeton underscores. Compulsory chapel services had become miserable events, with students attending in their pajamas under their coats, a napping and playing games in the pews, long sermons were met by coughing fits, and non-Protestant students grew vocal in their resentment over attending Protestant services. Protests against compulsory chapel were successful. Harvard was the first to end its policy in 1886. Yale ended its required services in 1926, the University of Chicago in 1928, and Princeton largely ended its requirement by 1935. In both the mission of the university and in its everyday life, religion's influence was, was increasingly diminished. The, war the waning importance of religion sounded a warning bell for those university presidents and leaders, including a cadre of university architects, who still fervently believed in the project of religion within, Amer within American higher education. A largely liberal Protestant leadership held on to the idea that education must include students' spiritual and moral formation. These leaders also adhered to the English Oxbridge whole man theory of education, which sought to return the focus back to the undergraduate and cultivate the whole person, intellectually, socially, and spiritually. Liberal Protestant leaders further sought ways to reconcile science and religion so they could exist side by side in the university. In 1908, St. Paul's Chapel at Columbia University, which you see here, hosted the Foucault Pendulum Experiment to demonstrate Earth's elliptical pole. And you see the photograph of this experiment on the right. Columbia President Nicholas Murray Butler deemed this demonstration, quote, a rather exceptionally appropriate use of the chapel, unquote, and its generation of, quote, feelings of awe, which associate themselves naturally enough with the religious building, unquote. Architecture became a key tool in the attempt to retain religion in campus life. Two examples of the chapel in the library, one at Harvard, the other at Yale, illustrate the desire on the one hand to retain religion on campus and the admission on the other that religion's role was changing. At the center of campus, the library became a proxy for reason and emerging and emerging empirical knowledge, while the chapel was still very much the symbol of faith. At Harvard, religion had a long and persistent presence on campus in Harvard Yard. Harvard's first library, Gore Hall, which I show you here, constructed in 1838 in the Gothic Revival style, overlaid an ecclesiastical feeling to learning. In the mid-19th century, Harvard constructed this building, Appleton Chapel, on Harvard Yard, which faced the back of Gore Hall. This relationship between Appleton and Gore Hall persisted until the construction of this building, Widener Library, in Gore Hall's place. Widener's construction presented a big problem for religion's expression on the yard. The new library was massive, a Corinthian column temple to knowledge. And because it was turned inward into Harvard Yard and faced Appleton Chapel directly, it made Appleton Chapel appear paltry by comparison. The small door you see on the long nave elevation of the chapel faced the immense steps and colonnade of the library. When the desire for a World War I memorial arose in the 1920s, Harvard President Abbott Lawrence Lowell advocated that Appleton Chapel be replaced with a new memorial chapel. For Lowell and others, Appleton was too small to be an effective billboard for religion. A Harvard committee said, quote, the university advertises by the size of this chapel, the number it expected to attend worship, and that this chapel's smaller size limited its invitation to the number it can accommodate, unquote. While alumni protested the need for a new chapel, they cited that Appleton Chapel actually held all of those choosing to attend Sunday services. President Lowell claimed that religion needed a bigger presence at the heart of Harvard. 
In Lowell's view, Harvard Yard needed a larger chapel to balance the library, to convey that both faith and reason were important, and were still important, to the university mission. A pamphlet proposing the church as Harvard's war memorial, which included this plan of the new church facing the library, assured, quote, that its spire will dominate the quadrangle of lawn and elms reaching southward to the Widener Library, un end quote, and that, quote, its massive columns will so strengthen the form of the church that it will not be diminished by the size of the library across the lawn, end quote. This is the new Harvard Memorial Church, dedicated in 1932. Its 170-foot spire rising above the church adds a vertical thrust to an otherwise low-lying building, leaving no presence, uh, leaving no doubt to the prominence of religion in the Harvard skyline. And it gives a sense of massiveness that equals uh, the hulking footprint of the library. That the monumentality of the new church balanced the monumentality of the library is clearly discernible. Whereas the previous Appleton Chapel was overshadowed by Widener Library, the new stairs and tetrastyle Doric portico of the new Harvard Memorial Church answered the library strongly. At the center of Harvard, within its largest open space, at the site of its commencements, faith and reason share an apparent equal footing, demanded by President Abbott Lawrence Lowell, even if now religion does not have a strong role within education at Harvard. In many ways, the Harvard Memorial Church is a symbol of another time for religion at Harvard, a symbol for the desire for religion to matter when in practice, by the 20th century, the late 20th century, or late 20th century, religion had lost its footing. At about the same time at Yale University, a similar struggle was occurring over the presence of religion on campus. In the 1920s, Yale undertook a massive building campaign to modernize and expand the campus. And I am showing you here architect John Russell Pope's new campus plan for Yale from 1919. In this replanning of Yale emerged the new center of Yale called Cross Campus. At Cross Campus was to be a new library, which you see at the top of this drawing, and a chapel, which you see right across from it at the bottom. As the Yale Corporation Architectural Plan Committee stated, quote, the buildings which represent most clearly and strongly the educational ideals of Yale are the new chapel and the new library. For that reason, they should be placed in, ver in a very prominent position on the new campus, unquote. Architect James Gamble Rogers designed this immense 5,000 seat chapel for the Yale Center, but his project was to be stymied by the ending of compulsory chapel at Yale. Quite simply, there was no longer a need for such a large new chapel. Rogers was nevertheless determined to place religion in the core of Yale, and in many ways he accomplished this in his designs for the Sterling Memorial Library from 1932. Here, Rogers created a library and cathedral. When you walk up to the entrance, you see a cathedral portal. When you walk inside, you are dwarfed by an entrance hall that reads as a nave space. When you use the card catalog, you do so in the side aisles. If you were to ever actually use an old time telephone, you would do so in a telephone booth that looks like a confessional. To check out a book, you visit the circulation desk that looks like an altar. And above you is a mur mural of Yale's alma mater that has allusions to the Virgin Mary. <coughs> the Sterling Memorial Library managed to keep religion on the center of campus, but as a metaphor. The building was a cathedral as library, not a cathedral on its own. While it importantly incorporated religion, sorry, it's back, okay. While it importantly incorporated religion or spirituality into the everyday life of Yale students, the cathedral library, the union of faith and reason, nevertheless trafficked in the sacred and the secular, combining the two and opening up the possibility for religion to be framed as a background rather than as a central event. Like the Sterling Memorial Library at Yale, the University of Pittsburgh, which was a private university until the 1960s, constructed the Cathedral of Learning in the 1930s as a kind of hybrid religious structure. As the building names su name suggested, the neo-Gothic details like pointed arch windows, trefoils and quatrefoils and tracery on an art deco 42-story skyscraper classroom conferred a religious significance to learning. Its three-story commons room was akin, was akin to a cathedral nave, replete with cluster columns, web vaults, more pointed arches, and stone tracery and ornament. 
while not explicitly a chapel, the Cathedral of Learning, like the Sterling Memorial Library, represented a new typology of a religious building, one cloaked in metaphor. The Sterling Memorial Library and the Cathedral of Learning were attempts to recast faith and reason for the modern university, but placing religion in the background and allowing for multiple interpretations of its symbolism was a double-edged sword. As much as university leaders and architects undertook measures such as large scale, emotional appeal, and religious metaphors to convey an image of religion's strength and persistent influence, their efforts failed to make religion as integral to the university mission as it had been in the 19th century. Religion could and would remain on campus, but in reduced form. Reason seemed to win out over faith in the modern American university. Following World War II, religion on the university and college campus looked markedly different, thanks in large part to the influence of architectural modernism. But stylistic choice was not the only major distinguishing factor. A new sensitivity to other faith traditions also inspired a new era of ecumenical worship spaces. Skidmore Owings and Merrill's much lauded Air Force Academy Chapel from 1962 was perhaps the closest throwback to the immense interwar chapels. But its, uh, uh, but its inclusion of a Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish worship space suggests a shift in accommodating religions. Aero Saarinen's Massachusetts Institute of Technology Chapel from 1955 was also sensitive to different faith traditions. Saarinen recrafted uh, a New England meeting house on the common and used, a non and used nonspecific symbols to create, in the words of religious historian Martin Marty, quote, holy emptiness and a cave for withdrawal, unquote. Importantly, Saarinen's chapel also speaks to a shift in size. While MIT specifically wanted to construct a chapel to remind its students of the responsibility of science to, uh, to society following the dropping of the atomic bomb, the MIT administration did not see religion as a common, large-scale community exercise. The practice of religion was to be individual, largely private, and respectful of multiple faith traditions. This chapel, the MIT chapel, seats only about 75 worshipers, a trend towards smaller chapel sizes that would dominate the post-war period. This focus on small-scale, non-denominational chapels is borne out in a number of other examples of post-war college chapels, and I offer you just one more. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe's chapel at the Illinois Institute of Technology, a non-denominational chapel notab notably sponsored by the Episcopal Diocese of Chicago, looks nothing like a traditional chapel. With no steeple, no external indication of a religious identity, the building is known in student, uh, on, in student vernacular as the God Box. On campus in the 1940s and 1950s, religion was transformed into a smaller, individual, meditative, and non-denominational event. Religion was present within higher education, but no longer held a central role. Now for my concluding thoughts. What I sketched out in the first part of this talk was how you attend a university where religion is inscribed in the campus and how I attended a university where it wasn't. Your experience of a private Catholic university and my experience of a large-scale public university in some ways represent extremes. The examples I have given you tonight of Harvard and Yale, universities that once claimed firmly their religious identity but now don't, demonstrate the struggle in the early to mid 20th century to retain religion as something important to higher education, to include both faith and reason within the university mission. So what role does religion play now in the American university? And here I must say, I'm thinking of non-denominational universities. Even when religion is present on campus in the form of a chapel, the practice of religion is largely diminished. Chapel services attract smaller numbers. The chapel itself is often used mostly for alumni weddings. Our current attitudes towards religion, our need to accommodate a much greater diversity beyond the Judeo-Christian core, and our sensitivity to inclusiveness, uh, even of atheism, complicate how we can express and accommodate religion for everyone. Yet this complication often leads to religion being privatized, away from the university mission wholesale, uh, leady, leaving questions of morality and character formation outside the classroom door. Now, this may not be your experience of higher education precisely because you attend a Catholic university, but I challenge you to think um, 
I challenge you to think about what religion looks like on other campuses and how religion does or do, does not factor into education. This is the important question. Are you receiving the kind of education that makes you think about the kind of person you are now and will become? That makes you think about your character, your morality? I hope so. As one person at the dedication of the MIT chapel said, quote, a world of educated devils is a terrible thing to contemplate, unquote. Let me finish with this image, which happens to be the inspiration for my book title. In 1927, nearly six months before the opening of the new Princeton University Chapel, the humor, ma humor magazine, The Princeton Tiger, published a cartoon that articulated the precarious role of religion in the modern American university. A child stands in front of the chapel asking, Mommy, is that, a thi is that thing a white elephant? The mother, peering from the edge of the drawing, stares open-mouthed at the enormous neo-Gothic facade, offering no response. Hanging in the space of that silence is the implication of the child's question. The cartoon's author ascribes a rhetorical uncertainty about whether or not the chapel is a white elephant, a euphemism for an expensive but unwanted or useless thing. This questioning of whether an enormous, ornate, neo-Gothic chapel was a thing of importance underscores the mutable meaning that college and university chapels came to have by the interwar decades. Whereas religion had a prevalent and assured role in American higher education in the 19th century, by the early 20th century, religion's role was changing. Just how religion relates to the project of higher education today is something we must be conscious of and the mission and purpose of the American university. Thank you.